over the years, the herd has always went up, down, up, down, up, and down. And then, and then uh, the population started going down, 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 down. many of our people go out there because it, it's too far out in the back. Back in the old days when everybody needed to go, they used to go walk from Telegraph Creek to go get meat and all this kind of stuff. But the herd there, the number has been around 30 in the area, okay. Started, there was no data, zero, like it, there was a, a flyover of the north part of the territory in 1992. That's really like was a concern for us. So we set out to do our own data collection. And when we first flew over that region, it's really identified from the Teltan as a key central caribou herd within the territory's significant cultural aspect to the Itziza mountain and uh, we were expecting a lot more to be honest and when we we flew and we flew and we flew and there's no tracks and we started like okay did we miss some that was the first question we asked like we seen 30 did we, did we miss a herd somewhere so we flew it again 27 we flew it again, 25. We flew it again, 24. We started to say, I think we didn't miss any caribou. Is this across the board? Is this affecting all of the caribou populations? Because we have different stressors within our region. The Spotsizi was located in the upper headwaters of the Stikine River, and they weren't really heading down to the Klapan Railway grade any longer like they used to be. They've shrunk their herd range and population. If they move because of the food, which caribou do, who knows? The caribou, they don't have those borders. They don't have those, I'm from the level mountain herd and I'm from the Senegal herd, right? <laughs> we put those there too. The level Cotty has uh, no roads into the region and Senegal has two intersecting basically road with access ways. So what was the cause of the decline? Was it climate change across the board or was it heavy predation on one herd? It's is threatened. It's, it's very much it's a concern for us. We're worried about that herd disappearing completely. We had population estimates at best that were more than 10 years old. For the most part, we didn't have trends for any of the seven major herds that we were talking about in the Taltan traditional territory based on the, the <laughs> formally collected data from surveys and from collaring. We did interviews, we collected biological samples, and we explored various questions, complicated questions about what was affecting caribou what they used to be like, what the territory looked like before when caribou were crawling all over the mountaintops and why, and what they were doing now and how they were reacting to the new pressures that the world had to offer. When I talk about health, I'm not talking about it has a disease or it doesn't have a disease. I'm talking about the big picture all of the different pressures that caribou are facing, whether it's uh, habitat fragmentation or predation or climate or f nutrition and all of the ways in which they're reacting to that.
thing is, we, myself, Julie, Tal, and Mateen, we're not here to advocate for anything. We don't say, you should do this or you should do that. Like, should, shouldn't be in our words. <coughs> our job is simply to provide information to help you folks make your own decisions. There's a lot of promise in solidifying community-based knowledge and making it defensible so it's not just an anecdotal campfire story, it's actually can be used to lead to action. They really declined in there for some reason, he doesn't know why. He said he, said he thinks it's a grizzly bear. My name is Mateen Hasami. I'm a community-based wildlife ecologist with the Wildlife Science Center. We co-facilitated a Northern Mountain Caribou Summit to bring people together, to build relationships, to share knowledge, and develop some sort of plan to enact forward-looking conservation for Northern Mountain Caribou. We see an opportunity with them to get ahead of the declines that have been observed with Southern Mountain Caribou so that we can have a fortress of the north where these northern mountain herds can do well into the future. And although they're not doing as great as they once were, their habitat condition, the footprint of humans in this landscape is relatively low. So there's still an opportunity for, for a lot of good work to be done. Hitting them again and again and again with the information, so that there's definitely a great value in continuing to do science and bring them in. They don't know like precise numbers of caribou in this region in general. Like the last surveys were like, a couple decades ago. If, if this is your writing, right, and you're here trying to get reelected, and I say to you, I don't like those 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 guys coming killing grizzly bears. The Martin, what is it now? Forty, fifty bucks. Right. The thing like and back in the 80s, we're getting over 200 in. Well, would step one be to do some sort of predator inventory on its island? I think the more people you can have in the room, the more information might be available to you. And there's different ways of expressing that information. There's different ways of knowing about caribou. And you can have people with scientific backgrounds. You can have people with traditional knowledge backgrounds. People who have grown up for generations in the tourism industry, the outfitting industry, and local harvesters on the land. And hey, you could even have officials that are coming from down south who have never seen a caribou. And everyone will bring a different perspective and perhaps a different piece of the puzzle because I think that's what it is. Caribou are a very complicated puzzle and what's happening with caribou across the nation is very complex and so if, if we're gonna address that complexity we better try and get as much information as we possibly can it's really nice to build a network of people that have the same uh, love for the animals and have the knowledge to address some of the problems, whether it's predators or encroachment or roads or mining. It's, you know, it's really good to hear a lot of different perspectives because you just never know when it's going to be your turn to have a problem. Well, we got a lot of caribou in our country. We depend on them too. It's nice to go to a uh, different territory and find out their challenges for their caribou. It'll help us out one day uh, ourselves. It's a lot nicer to see a herd of caribou on a mountain than nothing. Our way of life. But was uh, the main income in here when I was growing up and before that was of that guiding and hunting and and trapping and whatever had you just what people lived on. There was no butcher shop up here then.
You know, I have stories of my grandmother shooting caribou to sustain and feed her family. You know, and and so I, you know, I think about those things as well as, and I think about my children, my grandchildren, as does everyone else in this room, I'm sure. You know, we want caribou on the landscape for forever. Now in BC, we're on the cusp with, uh, you know, DRIPA and UNDRIP and the ability to take some steps with First Nations being the leaders. As I was involved in a caribou recovery program where there was only 250 caribou and the car crossed the Tagus First Nation herd, along with the IBEC. That caribou herd right now is over 5,000 animals. And we still haven't sat down as the five First Nations to come up with a harvest plan. We stopped hunting. We, we, we closed out all the all outfitters. We closed out the, the resident hunter. The First Nations, they went on a volunteer basis. There's still some First Nations that do harvest, but they harvest under subsistence hunting. And uh, where, where they, uh, what the hell do they call it? They use for car wash? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when they, when they ceremonial, use, when they, use. ceremonial use. So it's very initial, early stages where they're starting to finally, by legislation, they must use this as equal decision making data, right? And knowledge. So, <clears throat> whereas in the past it was, you know, pushed off to the side. Um, and now it's, it's okay. The traditional knowledge from myself as a First Nation manager, we can collect, but the local knowledge, you know, the user communities that are residing in the traditional territory, that's what I wanted to bring together. It's like, there's no better experts than the ones that are in their specific regions year after year after year after year. Just like somebody that's on a trap line or in a hunting camp, they go back, they know that intimately, and they can report on those little regions. And that's why, as Teltan people, I'm happy that we are still managing because our people didn't do this because of other things that are happening around us. It's because we managed our own areas because we're Teltan people within our Teltan nation. That was the difference right there, you know? It's not about everybody else around us, it's about our people because we're tall tents. And this is what we needed to do to keep the balance of food chain in our area for our future generation to come and for the future generation of all wildlife to come. Lots of um, feedback um, in the meetings and that that we go to the communities and lots of people say that um, why are we still putting out collars and why do we still have to do it every year? It's all because of, there's a system that you have to go through to prove to the government that there's actually a problem. So unless we have this data, we can't give it forward to the government. That's why it's so important to have collars out because they do the work that we can't when they're out on the land and all we have to do is flick on the computer and everything that the caribou have been through and are going through shows up on the computer and where they've been and how much wolves are chasing them so it's important. It opened my eyes up and changed my whole opinion about what these boys are doing, these young men and ladies within uh, Talta Wildlife Guardianship. It's needs to be more of us helping with everything that they're, they're doing because it's putting wildlife back on the ground and that's what outfitters all do. It's not about them taking animals, it's about the respect of keeping that animal there because that's what we all do. We need to do that to keep our business alive. We 
don't see that with a lot of the working groups that we facilitate, the partners we work with. It's pretty rare to see this like unanimous vision for growing more caribou. And we saw that here, which I think is so powerful. I hope um, that one day we could see caribou on the highway again and see caribou out on the land where we used to pass them on the road as I was a little kid because now we don't even see them in those areas and those are the important areas because that's where their food is. A lot of people really miss them and I'm one of them and uh, every year I wish that I could hunt a caribou but I don't because I want, I want their numbers to come back and I want to see them on our land again. Ha 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 ha!